Welcome to Paranormal Palace Radio, where truth equals reality, and truth is often stranger than fiction. Hello everyone, welcome to Paranormal Palace Radio. This is your host, Royce the Redneck Radio Man, and joining me tonight is going to be the Arthur Earl Lee of From the Bodies of the Gods, and... Um, This is a very unique topic for me on the show, in a sense. I mean, sure, I've covered ancient religions and mythology and mysteries before, but this is the first time I could think of to be covering uh, about hallucinogenics. Well, I covered hallucinogenics, but not specifically in early religions or early church or cannibalism. And I don't even think I've even covered cannibalism yet. But in other words, he's got a uh, subject that's new for me to you know, bring on and talk to you guys about, and um, I think you're going to really, you know, be very pleased with it. The man's got a very fascinating book. I've been reading this book myself over the last several days, and every time I got a chance to, because, you know, I got to post shows and, you know, schedule them and uh, other things that I do, so I can't just sit down the whole day and read it, so I read as much as I can. But, uh, yeah, I've been reading quite enough to tell that he's done a lot of research on this subject, uh, there's a lot of things he's covered that I was unaware of, and he's even explained something to me that I read in another book by another author, which I haven't told him about that yet, that I'm going to spring on him during the show. Before we go into all of that, he's on hold right now. I'm going to introduce him, and I'm going to give him a chance to, you know, tell you guys a little something about himself and, you know, how he got interested in this topic. So without further ado, um, Earl, how are you doing tonight? Well, I want to thank you for agreeing to come on to my show and discuss your book. As you heard me telling my audience, you know, it's, uh, you know, new, some new ground in here for me, some new ground for them. Uh, that should make it interesting as well as informative. And I, I'm really looking forward to a good show tonight. And I, I'm pleased that you, uh, you know, gave me consideration to come out here and do it. Oh, I'm, I'm more than happy to. Yes. <clears throat> well, real quick, like, why don't we start this with a little icebreaker? And you tell everybody, how did you get interested in this? And, you know, a little something about yourself. Well, uh, the way I first got started on this is back in the winter of 1965 when I was a boy. My mother took me to a mall in Memphis, Tennessee. And I found this copy. It, it was a comic book version of the novel Dracula. And I was just intrigued by this little paperback version of the Dracula story. And I began watching all these old horror films the mummy, the vampires, zombies, and I really got interested in that. And uh, But then as I started going to, into, when I went to college, I started seeing the same images and with really strange ideas attached to them. Like One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, the Ken Keesey novel, has uh, all sorts of vampire symbols in it and white whale and strange things. And I kept seeing the same kinds of symbols come up over and over again, mainly the, red, the color red and white, and symbols of people uh, being heavy stakes strewn through their heart, or the usual things you see in horror films. And I started thinking, maybe there's something to this. Why are these same symbols coming up over and over again? And I was thinking along those lines, and then in, in uh, 1984, I was watching, now this, this already strikes you as odd, but I was watching a TV show called Doctor Who. And you're probably familiar with the British sci-fi show Doctor Who. And I was thinking about mushrooms and, and vampires and where all this is going. And in this story of Doctor Who, there's this plant from outer space that takes over this house out in the English countryside and it takes control of the man who owns the house. And this man uh, kills a policeman, puts his body through a wood chipper, and then feeds the body to the plant. And then suddenly, this light went on over my head, and I said, that's what this is all about. It's all about plants and feeding human beings to plants. Oh. That, Go ahead. I'm sorry. I was just thinking, wow, that's really kind of, you know, barbaric for our day and age, in other words. Well, it was, it, the funny thing is that suddenly all these different bits and pieces started falling together, and it became clear to me that these ancient religions were very much based on the idea not only of human sacrifice, but of actually growing psychedelic mushrooms on the bodies of the dead. 
Yeah, and I'm I'm aware of the fact that um, you know, this uh, sacrificing humans, it was a you know issue for say like the Mayans and even the early Hebrews uh, out in the uh, desert, you know, before they got the Promised Land, <clears throat> they were doing this here <clears throat> as well, <clears throat> off and on. So, uh, you know, it was something that evidently, like your book indicated. Uh, was a common practice at least at one point in time. But before we go into that, I almost forgot to tell everybody or remind everybody that the call-in number is 832-632-7904. <clears throat> and if you scroll down, you'll see his picture and a cover of the book in the show description. Underneath that, you'll see a link to his book if you're interested. And that will be moved probably tomorrow to the archives or the next day. <clears throat> when I uh, put the next show up in its place, uh, most shows only are on the front page up until they're live and the day after they're live because they have to make room for the next show coming up. And also, you can find out more information about him on Great Reads. And that's uh, that's kind of a long URL, but it's www.goodreads.com forward slash Arthur forward slash show forward slash two seven seven three nine six dot earl underscore lee <clears throat> it's a bit of a stretcher but i'll be pasting that in the chat room here in just a second and as well as that for you people not listening here at the site um catching it at youtube or t uh, itunes or shoutcast the url here is www.paranormalpalace.com if you want to come catch the show live now um sorry about that earl but getting back to the topic at hand like I said, this was, um, and your book indicated this, a common practice from what I've read in the Bible and other sources, at least at one point in time, even more so than it was during the days of the, you know, desert wandering, shall we call them. Um, this practice goes quite back, doesn't it? Oh, yes. It, uh, in fact, the interesting thing about uh, the founders of, of some religions, like the Osiris in Egypt, and uh, Abraham in, uh, in the Hebrew scriptures, is that they had stories attached to them where they uh, reject human sacrifice. And that's like a step forward in, in the development of the religion. And, and a lot of uh, theologians have pointed to that. The story of Abraham is not only uh, saying that Abraham is a, an honorable man in God's eyes because he's willing to sacrifice his son, but it's also a story telling you that, you know, you should not do this anymore. <laughs> well, yeah, doesn't that kind of point out that the Judaism God at one point in time sanctioned this, that he would even recommend it to Abraham? Right, right. In fact, uh, the, the reason they uh, sacrificed humans is because humans were seen, to, were seen to be a better sacrifice than an animal, and because they were closer to human in their mind, closer to God. And that's why they, why they sacrificed humans, yeah. Well, and that makes a lot of sense. I mean, you know, in many scriptural teachings, human beings are placed above almost all of creation, except maybe angels, for example. Right, right. No, it's uh, it's at the beginning of, of uh, I think, all the major religions that, have, that for a time they practiced human sacrifice, but then some spiritual leader comes along, whether it's Abraham or Osiris, or, and they stop the practice of human sacrifice and say, no, nope, don't do it any, anymore. And usually about the same time, they institute circumcision, which seems kind of an odd connection there. I'm not, I suppose you could still sacrifice a bit of flesh, if you, even if you weren't flesh, <laughs> sacrificing the whole person. Well, yeah, you know, now that you bring up circumcision, because I, I think I only read a brief spot about circumcision. Yes, I did, in your book. It mentioned that um, the early church was, um, I think, holding on to the foreskins of uh, some cadavers, and... Um, you know, that it had some form of value as far as this uh, hallucinogenic or sacred oil or salve was uh, going. But, uh, I mean, you couldn't really get a lot off of a foreskin. But, I mean, it does make you stop and think, why did Yahweh want all those foreskins? Well, I think part of it is that for a person to be sacrificed to God, they had to be perfectly formed. They could not have any blemishes. And the covenant with God in, in cutting off the foreskin also says, well, we're not going to do this anymore. We're cutting, we're cutting our foreskins off to show that we're not perfect anymore and we, can, we should not be sacrificed. 
Well, that's an interesting concept. I hadn't thought about it in that, you know, from that perspective until you just said it. But, you know, that kind of really makes sense symbolically. If you're not if you're not perfect uh, anymore, then you can't be sacrificed. If you, I, mean, I think they also included various physical blemishes that were were bad. And I think there was a mindset at the time too that the human body reflected the spirituality. So if a person had uh, leprosy, for example, that was considered a sign of God's disfavor. And they really didn't think of diseases the way we do now. But uh, now. I know in your book you uh, tell us that this here, you've traced it all the way back to Crete. My question is, is there any indication that it goes further back than Crete? Oh, yes. uh, There is a uh, cave they discovered in southern Algeria, which has wall paintings that I think are about 8,000 years old. And one of the wall paintings is of a mushroom shaman. And the reason we know that is that there's another painting there that has people dancing in a circle, and they all have these huge mushroom-shaped heads. And the mushroom shaman is, is laying on the ground. He's wearing a face mask that looks like a bee's face, and his body is covered with these mushroom shapes. So it has to go back at least that far. That's a pretty good distance. Well, the one place you didn't mention in your book was Atlantis, and I, I bring this up because... I've done a lot of study, and I know there's a lot of people uh, out there. I've had some people on my show who feel strongly that uh, Crete or Santorini, to be more specific, was Atlantis. Uh, do you think there could be any connection between the uh, Atlantis, if Atlantis was ever found, and as a starting point for this type of thing? Because I know that uh, in the uh, Minoans, they had the uh, Linear B language uh, they found and deciphered in linear A they have not that could have been a further back language they like maybe Atlantean if the other theorist was right so I thought I would just kind of pick your head and see where you thought that might go well let me suggest this is a theory if back uh, 2000 BC the two largest civilizations in the Mediterranean were Egypt and Crete the Minoans if they needed mushrooms for their ceremonies. Now, you can grow magic mushrooms, but these other mushrooms, the Amenit and Muscaria mushrooms, you have to find them up in the mountains. Now, oddly enough, the, the, the uh, tombs that they have on Crete, they're similar tombs in uh, eastern Spain up in the mountains. And not only that, but there are also similar stone tombs in, in France on the western side again, up in the same range of mountains. And I think that maybe what they did was that uh, the Minoans and the Egyptians would trade, would send ships out to that area, to that mountain range, to uh, trade for these mushrooms and bring them back. And the reason I bring that up is that in eastern Spain, there's an area of country where the people there have a language that they've never been able to connect to, to any other language in the world. And I'm thinking... I suspect that maybe the language they're speaking there is actually a form of the Old Minoan language. That's an interesting uh, concept. Yeah, there might have been a a Minoan colony in Spain where they would uh, collect mushrooms and and then put them on the boat to go back to to Crete. But now, from what I was reading in your book, though, you go all the way back to Crete, even, and and as I understand, if if I read it correctly, this being 7,000 years ago, even as far back as that was, there came a time long before the days of Moses or Abraham that even they were getting away from human sacrifice and getting into the bull. Is that correct? Right. right. They, I think they started moving away from having regular human sacrifices, and probably they only had a human sacrifice once a year at their fall. Uh, they have a fall festival that they still that they still performed years later in Greece, where it was the, uh, called the opening of the new wine. And I think they probably just had a human sacrifice at that point once a year. Well, was there any chance that these people were actually at any point in time uh, consuming the flesh and the body fluids, uh, you know, without any kind of other preparation or mixture, uh, like not in the mushrooms? Because I know that there's a lot of your book that addresses that they were actually growing these mushrooms off of the dead bodies. 
But was there a point before that that maybe they were just consuming the body itself? Well, I suspect that there are there are ways that some parts of the body might have found their way into the, the sacred foods and sacred oils. I know, for example, with the Egyptians, that they actually had cadavers they kept hanging around, and they would take the liquids, and they'd call them the effluxes, off of the dead bodies, and bring them, and they would use them to, to add to their oils and then anoint people. Uh, if you were going to join the religion of Horus, they would anoint you with this oil that included the uh, fluids that came off of the cadavers. Yeah. Yeah. Now, that's pretty sounding to me. <laughs> I don't know about you, but I don't know. Yeah, uh, I can see it. it's really uh, weird <clears throat> by our standards today. However, we have to understand the back then the mindset was a whole lot different, and uh, I think in many ways probably a lot more superstitious as well. Uh, do you think that there were ever any real flesh and blood gods that demonstrated this or gave them the idea for this? Well, that's, that's an interesting question because I think that a lot of the uh, the sacrifice of humans, I mean, some of this is historical, but I think some of the older stuff may be just a matter of misinterpretation. I think, and I think we see this happening over and over again in history. Let me give you an example of the Mayas in, Cent in uh, Central America and Mexico. I think that they had a mushroom uh, cult of the dead, much like the ones in Greece and Egypt, but that at some point when they were conquered by the Aztecs, they hid their secrets, and all they gave to the Aztecs were the outer symbolic forms. And the Aztecs, misunderstanding this, decided that, yes, you really do take people up on the pyramid and cut their hearts out and offer them the sun, not realizing that what they were being given was really a, a spiritual teaching, not this cannibalistic cutting of people's hearts out. Yeah, and that leads us to another question, because you've mentioned in your book in more than one place about this here habit of, um, you know, some parties, uh, the initiated, the elite, getting this here mushroom or these ointments or salves or anointings, chrisms, uh, as you put it, and the other ones that were supposedly less advanced not doing it. Do you think there was any um, political reasons going on behind this here? Why? It wasn't made uh, equal to everybody? Well, at least uh, fairly early on, it would, you would probably just have the higher-ups. You know, if they have a small society of like a few thousand people, then maybe you have enough to go around. But if you have thousands and thousands of people, then it becomes more difficult to come up with enough supplies to make everybody happy. And it would just, I think, tend naturally to, to gravitate up toward the wealthy. The wealthy would get the real sacraments and the Poor people would get uh, maybe some beer with some opium put in it or something like that. Well, that wouldn't make a lot of sense. Now, you follow this from um, through Crete, through Egypt, through, uh, you know, the early Hebrews, uh, you know, all the way down through church history, which I found to be very interesting because as a student of church history, one of the things that I do realize is that you had Christians before 365, and then you had a separate branch that would be considered the Orthodox or the Catholic uh, Universal Church that uh, was just one of the one group that really ended up winning out over all the rest. So the question that came to my mind, which I think I've already covered in your book, just in my reading, but I thought I would ask it for the sake of the listeners, is... We know that there's enough evidence out there. You found enough and put it in your book about the Cathars, the Gnostics, and other groups that were not in the uh, considered orthodox move that did follow this procedure. However, how much evidence is there that the actual early church fathers of the Catholic Church was also at least at one point in time following the same act? Well, to my mind, the... Uh smoking gun, if you want a smoking gun for this thing, is uh, Second John. Because in that epistle of Second John, he says that, he's speaking to the, his believers, and he says, you have an ointment from the Holy One. 
And once you put that ointment on your body, you will have an instantaneous knowledge of all of our teachings. And then he says again a little bit further. Again, he refers to this ointment they have. But once you have this ointment on, you don't have to listen to what anybody else says because you will have an instantaneous Gnostic knowledge of what we represent of what Christianity is. And that one, to me, just seals the deal. I can't, there's no way to explain that one away. Right. But this was before the days of Constantine as well. And what I was wondering about was, um, you know, did we have anything showing that after the days of Constantine, was the actual original church actually partaking, in other words? And, uh, you know, I can't help but wonder about that, because now that would lead to the next question naturally being, at what point did they stop? Or, you know, what brought about, uh, as well as what brought about the change from uh, the actual cadavers to the wine and wafers they have today, in other words. Right, right. Well, I think it was about the time of Constantine that they start shifting back and moving away from it and restricting access to it. And you see the same thing happening in the Hebrew church when Jesus said to the Pharisees, you do not go in, nor do you allow others to go in. He is strictly talking about the holy foods and the sacred foods. He says, you're not letting other people do it, and you're not even doing it yourself. What's wrong with you? How can you this way? And I think you could say the same thing about the Christian church. Once you came up to Constantine, suddenly they're all backing away from this, and they're substituting just, you know, wafers and grape juice or whatever they were offering, and, and uh, they were trying to back away from it. And I think the reason for that is because if you can experience the divine directly, then why do you need a priest? It's not like these guys are unnecessary. Mm. I think that pretty scared them. Yeah, that kind of put them out of business real quick, in fact, wouldn't it? <laughs> yeah, you're not living the high life if these people are going directly to God and experiencing God without, without your help. But, you know, and back in those days, you could see where these people would really believe that they were, um, you know, communicating with God through these mushrooms or through these oils and salves. But if you fast forward to our time and you look back at it, wouldn't the question arise, since we have not never had the experience ourselves of, how do we know these people back then were really experiencing God and not just having a hallucination? Well, that's... That's a very difficult question. Uh, there's an author named uh, Clark Heinrich who's written a book where he describes his experience uh, taking uh, mena to muscaria mushrooms. And the things he describes sound very much like uh, the religious experience because he, he was able to see what he thought was heaven. He experienced things that he described as being like hell. And he described an experience when he took the mushroom he once where he fell into this pit of despair, and finally it lifted, and he said, I felt like I've been born again. And so I think there is currently people who are doing so this who are seeing that, oh, yes, this is what they're writing about. In fact, in one case, Heinrich described taking some mushrooms and then reading the Gospel of John. And he said, suddenly it all made sense to him, because he could see exactly what John was talking about. So I think there is something there, yeah. Well, you know, this might help uh, lend some credence to that. This is the part that I didn't tell you about that I mentioned earlier. Here a few months back, I read The Master Game put out by Robert Bavall and Graham Hancock. And no, they don't cover the Eurochrist like you did. However, one of the things that they mentioned in their book that I haven't forgotten to this day because... It made absolutely no sense. When things don't make no sense, they get inside of me, and I just can't let them go till I can make them make sense. And that was, they made the statement that the Cathars and the Gnostics, back during the Dark Ages, they would actually go in to have their heads chopped off to be burned at the stake and otherwise tortured horribly with smiles on their face. Uh, you know, no fear, looking forward to it. And I'm like, how does a person do that? I mean, like there's no concept of pain or fear. But when I read about your mushrooms, that's when the thought occurred to me that if they had ate these mushrooms and they had had this experience, and maybe if they still had it in their system, 
that might have made such a procedure easier. What do you think? Oh, yeah, absolutely. In fact, I think that with the uh, people early on who were martyrs, one of the things they had in their mind is that once they were killed, that their families and their friends would take their body and they would then be able to join uh, with the others as a source of, of mushrooms for others and that there was some spirit of Christ within them and it would go on through them. They were kind of a conduit for that power. Well, that would definitely explain that part of the factor and it would lead, lend credence to what you're saying about a religious experience. Surely it had to be an experience that was... Uh, Convincing, in other words, and one of the things that I would look for at this point was, do we have a, um, what am I going to say, like a joining of the minds, uh, can you, do you know if there's been, like, say, more than one experience brought on by the mushrooms that had the same type of experience? I mean, is there a cohesion of, uh, more multiple people that had these mushrooms that had the, a very extremely similar experience, or were there a bunch of random, ex different experiences? You know what I'm saying? Well, I think that's why the Manhattan mushroom in particular is so important, because I think that there's a consistency that comes with that that you don't have with the, uh, the magic mushrooms. And I think that in one of his books, uh, Clark Heinrich talks about an experience where he and a friend of his uh, ate these mushrooms, and he had, and they had an experience they described as being like the Pentecost, in that they could actually sit across the room from each other and somehow knew what each other was thinking. Yeah, and I think you mentioned something in your book about there was uh, a one kind of mushroom that could cause you to have an experience with demons and another kind of mushroom that could cause you to have a, you know, an angelic or a heavenly experience, in other words, if I remember correctly, isn't that correct? Uh, actually, the, the amenity mushroom can go either way. It just depends on how it hits you. Uh, and see, that's a pro that's part of what, where religion came from, too, is that, that people would take these uh, mushrooms and they had no idea whether they were going to have a, a good experience or a really bad one. And so they would make preparations ahead of time to, to try to protect themselves. They would put magic inscriptions on the cup or on the plate, or they would say a prayer. And that's what uh, uh, the Lord's Prayer in particular uh, is about. It's a prayer to protect you from the bad things that might happen. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses. Lead us not to invasion. Deliver us from evil. And that's a protective prayer that you, you say as you're getting ready to eat the, eat the Eucharist. So it wouldn't be a, a different kind of mushroom being a determining factor. Maybe if there was a determining factor, and this is only if, would you say maybe perhaps, and I'm, I'm just guessing here, uh, that maybe your internal condition might be a determining factor in the uh, kind of experience. Like if you had, um, you know, bad fruits, uh, you were a murderer at heart or something like that, you might have a, a more demonic experience than, say, somebody that was loving, kind, and compassionate? Yes, that's, you're exactly right. I think that is very much what is happening, that the people who believe in themselves, believe they had lived a virtuous life and had done the right thing, uh, when they took the mushrooms, they would have a good experience generally, whereas people who had done bad things and bad things in their lives, when they would take the mushroom, they would see all sorts of horrible visions of snakes. And in fact, there's a, uh, there's a mushroom shaman in Mexico, who said that very thing? He said, "If you're a bad person, you take it, and you see all these horrible things that come after you." Well, you know that would make a lot of sense uh, as far as like uh, when I was at the Southern Baptist Church, because I've been in Luciferian, Pentecostal, Baptist, Southern Baptist. Uh, you know, I've been around, in other words, Catholic even. But the Southern Baptists, I know themselves, and I think Catholics would tell you up front that you should not partake of communion or Eucharist lightly and you should deal with your sins before you do because if you don't you take it unto yourself you're bringing which would kind of go along with what that guy was telling you wouldn't it yeah in fact i think there's a uh, i don't remember the passage exactly but there's a place uh, in the new testament where jesus says I guess maybe, it was, maybe it was paul where paul says you know you should not partake of the eucharist unless you're pure of heart because 
This stuff could kill you. <laughs> but some people will, some churches will quote that today, and maybe they're just not aware of the fact that Paul was taking it back to that kind of mushroom because they had no idea what he was referring to because in today's church, it's thought of as wine and bread, in other words. Yeah, yeah. Well, that, that's the thing. We, we have all these things that have come out of these religions way back, but all that exists now is just like the the outer structures, the forms and the, and the symbols and the images. We don't have the, the content anymore. We just have this uh, uh, paper mache version of it. Uh, it's uh, it's very sad, actually, I suppose. I mean, because we could have a real church with real people experiencing real things. Instead, all we have is this problem. Well, we could uh, if, you know, your research is correct, and you've got a lot of evidence here. But me personally, I can see one problem with that, which is basically the people themselves. I mean, let's say this is all absolutely correct, and there's no flaws in it anywhere. But what about today's people? Don't you think it'd be kind of hard for them to bear a doctrine that involved uh, the eating of uh, dead flesh? Uh, yeah, yeah. In fact, that's that was the problem that Jesus had when he tried to get uh, other Jews to come into this. Because I think there's a passage in the Gospel of John where he talks about, you know, this is, you, before you can see heaven, you have to eat my flesh and drink my blood. And the people in the crowd around him say, oh, this is a hard thing he's teaching. How can we do this? And it says that quite a few of them left and, and didn't follow him anymore after that because it was just too big an obstacle for them. Well, yeah, it's a hard thing. I mean, I've talked to people who will um, watch shows where people are stranded out in the desert or, you know, been to a, a shipwreck and they barely survived on a desert island or, you know, whatever the case may be that get desperate enough to eat each other just to survive. And so many people, are, you can hear them talk about it, and I would have to die. I couldn't do that. You know what I'm saying? Oh, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a difficult idea. But I guess I'm not really advocating that we go back to actually directly eating people so much as realizing that the religious traditions come out of a belief where... Yeah. It came from using people's dead bodies. Well, I'll be honest with you. Me, personally, even, and I understand you're not at, uh, suggesting that, I would have a lot of trouble if it was the dead body itself. Uh, the mushrooms that come off from it, well, that's not quite as close. That's kind of secondhand. That may not be as... <laughs> you know what I mean? Oh, yeah, yeah. I just... <laughs> But I think that's part of where a lot of our confusion, a lot of problems. Let me give an example. Right now, there's a cult of the dead in Mexico called uh, the Santa Muerte, and it has two million members. And they are they actually worship this skeleton of this woman who I guess looks like the Virgin, but she's dressed like a woman as a skeleton. And they basically uh, they worship the dead. They worship death. And uh, recently, as uh, it's just been discovered that I think about a year ago they actually killed two people and drank their blood. And my feeling is that you know maybe if this, my book is translated into Spanish and they go down and it goes down there and they read about it, maybe they'll understand that no, you're not actually supposed to kill people. This is all the symbolism. You're not supposed to actually do these things. At least that's my hope anyway. Well, I'll be honest with you. From my way of thinking. I think everybody ought to read your book at least a minimum of once, if not more times. And everybody should get a copy for the simple fact being that, okay, granted, it may have some things that in today's world, the people being the way they are today, may repulse you. However, it's got a lot of factual information about a lot of things that transpired in the past. And this here, well, there's an old saying, those that don't know history don't learn from history are, you know, bound to repeat history. And I think you need to know, really, no matter what you think of whatever happened, what actually did happen and, and learn from it, in other words. Well, that, that's my hope, too, that people will, will read it and, and understand that this is where these images come from that are still in our religion, that are still popping up in our, our literature and our art, and realize that these things are what our ancestors did. Uh, whether we accept them or not, but 
you know, we can we can stop doing the bad stuff. We can stop fighting amongst ourselves. You know, the Protestants can stop killing the Catholics. The Catholics can stop killing the Muslims. And and they all realize that we're all just human. We don't. We all came from the same roots. Yeah, we don't have to keep repeating these same mistakes over and over. Yeah, I would tend to agree with you. And I'm with you. I wouldn't exactly advocate the idea of pulling a body out of the grave and having lunch, but <laughs> a bit of a gross way to put it. But, um, you know, in all honesty, um, I feel sure that our ancient forefathers probably didn't do this lightly. I mean, they may have been more suspicious, I mean, uh, superstitious back then than we are now, but they were not a dumb people. I mean, um, look at Plato, look at Socrates, um, Philo, uh, you know, Greeks were partaking of this according to your book, as well as Hebrews and Minoans and Egyptians. Uh, you know, some of these people were geniuses and they partook of this. I mean, you know, they there had to be a good reason for them to believe it, you would think, wouldn't you? Well, yeah. Let me give another example that I found really interesting. One of the things that's common in these mushroom cultures is a fear of serpents. And you ask yourself, what? I mean, of course, you know, you have the cobras are dangerous or poisonous snakes are dangerous, but why are they always bringing these snakes into the religious imagery? And I think part of it is that they looked at the mushrooms and saw that the mushrooms were being eaten from the ground up by these little grubs and worms, and they associated worms and serpents as being representatives of evil. They were destroyers. And so in our religion, we have all these serpent images. And many of these things that you see, the images used in religion, are efforts to placate these uh, serpents, to make them not harm us, you know, to, to make them, uh, what's the right word, propitiate, or uh, to, to somehow make them so that they would not attack us uh, while we were participating in these rituals. And so that's carried on in our religion, too. All these serpents you see in the, in the walls of, of the, the pyramids in Egypt and and the serpents that appear in the, the art in the Middle Ages, they recognized that that was a symbol of evil, and the, but you could also perhaps placate it, or, or if you gave it the right, did the right gestures, or used the right kind of cup, that you could avoid harm. And it's, what, what's interesting, too, is that people associated that with leprosy, because people back then thought that leprosy was actually worms under your skin. And if you remember in the story of uh, Exodus, when uh, Moses goes to the Pharaoh, he sticks his hand under his cloak and pulls it out, and it's leprous. Then he sticks it under his cloak again, pulls it out, and the leprosy is gone. And that is proof of his magical power, that Moses had the, the ability to, to get rid of these evil uh, worms that were under your skin. And then, of course, he does the thing with the rod that turns into a serpent. Again, another demonstration of his power over evil. Yeah, and I saw something uh, not long ago. I was talking about serpents, about Moses and his serpent, the Egyptians that, um, you know, where you could cast it on the ground and it turned into a snake and pick it back up, it turns into a rod. Um, I read that there's a way to hypnotize a serpent so that it could become stiff like a rod and then one minute it can go back into being a snake when, you, you know, it falls out from underneath the trance. But I, I just thought I'd throw that in there, remembering it when you mentioned it, because it brought it to my mind. Right. Well, the fact that Moses was able to control these serpents and make them do what he wanted <coughs> was a demonstration that he had great magical power, perhaps even more than all of uh, Pharaoh's magicians combined. Yeah, um, and that was with the whole purpose of the... Uh, demonstration that and fear <laughs> <laughs> yes though fear, fear usually works pretty well uh, <laughs> even not even when you're facing fear you can make oh yeah i mean look how well fear worked for the early church oh yes absolutely uh they they had their part their uh they wanted to have a certain amount of power over people and they were willing to do whatever it took pretty much to keep it well do you think in your opinion that this here is being practiced anywhere, say, uh, in Europe or the Near East or even in America today, the uh, Eurocrist with the real mushrooms in this? It's 
very hard to say. I mean, the fact is that uh, some of these mushrooms are actually illegal to use, so that would that in itself might uh, push it underground. But I haven't actually seen uh, any evidence or reports of things going on right now that would lead me to think that it's going on. But, you know, maybe 100 years ago, who knows? I mean, yeah. Clearly, Knights Templar were still doing it up until they were destroyed. I uh, know. So I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. Please forgive. Oh, that's, that's all right. Uh, later on, the, the witches, too, also did a lot of this kind of thing. Yeah. What I was going to say a minute ago was I saw on TV not long ago that there were churches in Utah. Well, this was about roughly 10 years ago. I call it not long ago because in today's age, a lot, a decade doesn't seem that long for certain things. But um, anyway, they were still uh, doing this here dance in these small town revival churches with the uh, the actual poisonous snakes and drinking this uh, strychnine poison without actually dying. So... You know, it goes to show that even in today's world or even in recent times up to 10, 10 20 years ago, uh, some things that would seem unbelievable to us still happen. Well, I think there's still <laughs> churches in uh, Tennessee that do that, as I recall. But the, what they don't understand is that when, when Jesus says you can take up serpents and you can drink any poisonous thing and not be harmed, he's really talking about the the sacred foods that you can you can eat these things that will harm you because he has you have his protection uh, and that's where that really comes from not from he doesn't really want us to actually take up real serpents I mean that's that's crazy the next question is how do the people survive this well there's uh, if you've been enough times apparently there's a guy in India who has a collection of poisonous snakes like the twelve deadliest snakes in the world. And over the years, he's been bitten so many times that now it doesn't affect him. In fact, they use his blood to make serum for some kinds of poisons. So, I mean, yeah, if you're, uh, if you're accustomed to it in small doses, you can, your body can build up a defense of this stuff. Well, that makes a lot of sense. I've heard of that before, that, you know, a little bit at a time, you kind of grow an immunity, which would make a lot of sense if they started out small. Uh, I wasn't there to really actually get to see, but it still seems like a pretty scary process to me. I, I'd be like that guy on the record with and the cookie guy, World of the Geekland Law Brothers. Uh, I'd ask them where they wanted their back door. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's an old story about a saloon out west, and apparently the city had an ordinance that you couldn't drink alcohol unless you were bitten by a rattler. So the bar had a, a pet rattler they kept <laughs> there. And if you wanted to drink a whiskey, you would just let the, the rattler numb you a little bit, and then you could get your drink of whiskey. So <laughs> but I think it had his teeth pulled, to tell you the truth. <laughs> I would definitely like to hope so, in the very least. Um, now, I was going to also ask you, because we've been on here like 45 minutes so far, is there anything that I haven't covered that you would like to cover that I haven't thought to bring up? Well, I, I think you, you've done a very good job of bringing things up. I think that what I want, if there's nothing else that I convey today, I w I'd like people to understand that back 6,000 years ago, there were all these religions across Europe and North Africa that were called cults of the dead. And in different areas, they developed in different ways, like in Egypt, it developed into that religion, and Crete, it developed a different way. But they all came out of the same basic collection of ideas, and, and they developed very specific kind of practices, but uh, they all really had a common origin. Well, listen, I'll tell you what. Like I told you at the beginning of the show, I didn't really allot myself enough time when I scheduled you to finish the book. I got to 138, uh, which you said covered the main body of it, but I know there's still about another 70 pages worth of inter interesting information I hadn't got to. I was going to suggest, if you're interested, if you, you know, enjoyed yourself thus far, that maybe you come back in August and maybe we can bring people up to speed and maybe finish some of the area I haven't covered as well. I think that's a great idea. I think once people get a chance to look through it, and they, they might develop, may see holes in my argument, which is fine with me, but uh, I, I'd enjoy that, yeah. 
Yeah, uh, and I didn't tell everybody listening yet, but, you know, uh, listeners out there, basically in this guy's case, I already had this month filled when um, I got the notice about his book, and what I really done was I had a cancellation come up in April, or, I'd, or was it that I'd given somebody a date and then remembered I changed, yeah, and I remembered that they weren't able to make it when I confirmed it, and I gave them another date, and then I forgot to fill the date that I'd first given them they couldn't make. That's how that one happened. So what I'd done was I went ahead and streamlined him into that because I could tell from the title of his book and the, you know, reading the description of it that this was interesting. I want to hurry up to get it on the air. And I said, well, hey, I've got an opening. But when I did it, I didn't stop and think that, hey, the holidays are here. i got a son with a, you know, karate tournament coming up. I've got my cooking I do and promoting, and I may not have enough time to finish the book. So uh, I gave him the appointment, and then I read as much of the book as I could to be able to talk to him about it tonight. So that's the reason why I didn't get this here finished, folks, and not apologize for that. Um, I thought it only fair to tell him about it, Earl. <laughs> <laughs> but um, still, the the topic is it's so unique. It's so, I, I would say if I hadn't read your book or before I read it that it's not covered much, but that wouldn't be right. That wouldn't be correct. I read in your book several people that you quoted that talked about this same thing. And I mean, even E.A. Wallace Budge, um, and I might be getting his name, was it E.A. Budge? Or I thought it was E.A. Wallace Budge. You know who I'm talking about. You you quoted from him. And most people, you and me, I know, know the man to be co considered in his day a very reliable source that, uh, you know, was well-respected in his time, in other words. Right. He was uh, the uh, head of the Egyptology department at the British Museum back in the uh, turn of the century. Actually, I should say the last turn, <laughs> search of the century before this one. Uh, but he's wrote quite a few books. Uh, he probably knew more about Egyptology than anybody since then. Uh, he's very carefully studied and translated all of this stuff. I think he's got like 30 books out there. That many of them have been reprinted by by Dover, and they're, they're fairly inexpensive. If somebody wants to study the Egyptian religion, I would definitely recommend Budge. He's, he's a very enjoyable read. I mean, sometimes you read stuff and just like you're falling asleep. But <laughs> excellent. <laughs> he is an excellent writer, very clear, and very impressive. I, I, I did use his his books uh, quite often. Uh, and you also he, quoted a bunch of other. I mean, I lost count, 10, 20, you know, whatever other authors that, uh, you know, you evidently read their work. And, you know, it's, I can't say that it's not covered much after seeing all those quotes you put in there. I can say I just haven't seen it, but I must not have been looking it up under the right titles. <laughs> well, it, it's taken me 30 years to get to this point. Uh, that's, <laughs> that's the absolute truth. I, I, I started collecting stuff back in the early 80s and... Uh, and collecting quotes, and I've got a, a library of, of books with lots of underlinings in them, and that's was the material for this. Yeah, yeah it was a lot of work. Well, I ain't going to kid you. I read some of those names, and I planned on Googling them later and seeing if they had websites, because I was going to bring them on the air later on, too, if they wanted to come. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, definitely, uh, Clark Heinrich is, is really a fascinating person, because uh, he's actually had the direct experience of working with this stuff. Uh, and uh, his books are just amazing. Uh, and there are a lot of people that, that oddly enough, seem to be more or less forgotten from the 19th century and the early 20th century. Uh, there was a man named Alan Godby who was a biblical scholar, lived in Missouri, and uh, he was writing stuff in the 30s that would just blow your mind. I mean, uh, his books now, you can hardly even buy them because they usually run for like 150 to $250 wow. per book. And I just looked up. At this today, I actually found a copy of one of his books for $25. And I thought, holy cow. <laughs> I bought it immediately. I'm taking it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 20, 20 bucks, that's mine. Because you know? the stuff he wrote in the 30s is still under copyright. See? So his older stuff you can usually find online. But the, the newer stuff, which is to me the stuff that's really helpful, uh, that you can hardly get your hands on anymore. Well, you know, the one thing that I really bring home from reading your book and from having this talk with you is 
I would not recommend to anybody to say, well, hey, I don't want this religion because they used to practice cannibalism. And, well, I've been taught that's, I would, uh, d- I know some people could do that. I know there was a time I would do that. And I would personally want to discourage people from doing that. And, uh, you know, to place it in its proper perspective as part of the bigger whole picture, as a, a part of human history, a part of the fabric of time that, you know, had to occur along with other things that was not necessarily approved of. Well, yeah, you know, the, in ancient times, people <coughs> lived with death all the time. I mean, there was disease, there was all kinds of different problems, and if, if you wanted to go... Even if you were going to market to buy food, you would see slabs of beef here or there or mutton or whatever that you would buy. And, and people had a much closer relationship to death than we do today. Uh, and I think that's maybe is, is not necessarily for the best. Um, I think we, we try to sanitize things way too much. In fact, they say now that a lot of uh, small children get these diseases because they don't go out and play in the dirt enough. They're not gonna I've, heard t- I've heard that. I really have. But, yeah, I mean... You see it on reality TV shows about people eating a rat just so they can stay in the show. I mean, is there really any difference between a rat, a human, a cow, uh, a kangaroo, a dog? You know, some countries they eat dogs. But when you start looking at the fact that the further out you go from America, the more bizarre things get, then you have to really ask yourself, was this really so bizarre for its time? Well, for example, even today, there are places in Southeast Asia where you can go out to the vendor and pick out your dog, and then they'll slaughter the dog for you, and you can take it home, or or they'll cook it for you there. I mean, there there are a lot of practices that seem bizarre to us today that are are still going on. It's it's just part of the uh, part of life, and it's just that we're not accustomed to it anymore. And a part a lot of people don't want to look at, but. Then again, you know, uh, there's a part you don't look at, there's a part you're missing. Well, you know, when I was about, oh, I was in high school, I guess, we had a, a, a German gentleman who lived down the road from us who died in his home. And my father took me there with my brother and the local sheriff, and they found him in there and hid in bed for about a week, and they carried him out, and, and I saw it all right there, you know. This, this is what it looks like. Uh, and But no, how many people have that experience anymore? I did. I found my grandmother <clears throat> dead in the garden when I was 11. Had to call for the people to come pick her up and that. But again, uh, like you say, just because you did and I did, don't mean everybody did. <laughs> well, there's a lot of people who don't have any idea what that's like. And I, I think that maybe I'm missing some, well, I shouldn't say they're missing something, but, but it's an experience of life that people used to have all the time that, that people today just rarely ever see because we're so such a hurry to get the body away as soon as we can. Well, I think they're not better for it, I don't think. Well, I can. I was also going to say earlier, and I, d- I don't want to let everybody get out of here without mentioning this, is while it is true, from what I gathered in your book, and correct me where I'm wrong, uh, that at one point in time, eating the actual human flesh was a um, pretty common event. Somewhere during the course of time, even when they were still doing this, didn't it become... Uh, less common to actually sacrifice a human and eat its flesh and become more common to wait until the cadaver died and then just grow the mushrooms on it and, um, you know, eat the mushrooms after the natural death occurred? Well, I think that there was a clear shift away from from humans and toward the animals, especially uh, bulls. But I mean, but, you know, somewhere between the human eating and killing and the animals, uh, wasn't there another period like I was describing in between the middle of that? Uh, I'm not sure I understand. I okay. I'd... Like they maybe say for a while at first were killing human beings and then eating on the flesh and the fluids. And then they went from that to, well, just taking people as they died and growing mushrooms and eating those. And then moved from that to animals. Did, could, did it, could it have occurred in that kind of sequence of events? Yeah, I really think that uh, the, the sacrifice of eating uh, human flesh was very short-lived, and uh, I think it was uh, much uh, less common than than the, uh, the mushrooms growing on a cadaver of somebody who's already dead. Which that even also also gave away to animal after time. 
but uh, probably the animal sacrifice didn't have the same impact as the uh, mushrooms did, is what I'm guessing. Well, that, that's very likely, but that may also be the source of why the Egyptians have all these different animal-headed gods. They have gods with bulls' heads and uh, birds' heads and uh, dog heads, and it, it may be that if you consumed a mushroom grown on a, a dog that you might tend to think of yourself <laughs> and <laughs> kind of like that at some point. <laughs> well, anything's that possible. That comes from. Yeah, that, that's possible. Well, um... Have you got any last-minute thoughts for my listeners? Well, I, I just tell you, I hope that uh, people approach my book with a, a kind of an open mind because I know it, it, it does sound kind of bizarre, but I think I've got all the evidence there that uh, lined up in, in a row. I think I've got my ducks in a row, and uh, if I've made a mistake somewhere, I, I'm sorry, but I, 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 this is the way, this way it makes sense to me. It looks to me like the simplest answer to a lot of complex problems. And that's really what we want to find, too. If there's a simple answer that explains a lot of these strange things, then maybe that's what we should think about, you know. I would personally challenge anybody to buy your book, read it, and look for where your research is lacking and try to find it. I mean, research-wise, you've done a fantastic job, in, at least in my opinion. Now, I'm not saying you can't find anything wrong, but I think if anybody was to buy your book with an open mind and actually read all the evidence you've put, and maybe even take the time to Google this stuff and double-check you, I'm pretty sure that they would find that, you know, an open mind is warranted, in other words. Well, you know, the, the, even the, the Bible scholars today are starting to come around to some of these ideas. I mean, for example, they're just now beginning to realize that in the first couple centuries of the church, people did not necessarily go to church. They went out to the graveyard or to the catacombs. And, all, and many of the services, especially for poor people, were out in these in the graveyards. And I don't think we ever really think about that much anymore. But that was they calculated how many Christians there were at a certain time, and how much floor space there was in the churches. And they realized that there just isn't nearly enough room. And that kind of thing kind of surprised me too. Okay. Yeah. Well, I tell you what, Earl. It's really been a pleasure meeting you. It's been a pleasure talking to you. You're a very, in my opinion, an impressive man. You're a very sincere man. You're a very humble man. I mean, you're just sitting there admitting yourself that, hey, you could have made a mistake in this year and that you're not saying you're 100% right, that what you're saying is this is what makes the most sense to you after 30 years of study, which anybody would expect you to draw a conclusion after that many years of study. Who does that much study and don't draw a conclusion that makes sense to them? But that's still a very humble approach. You know what I'm saying? Well, th thank you very much. I, I really appreciate it because I'm not really trying to put myself forward. I'm just trying to come up with answers that, that make sense, uh, that I hope that other people can, can uh, maybe quell doubts that they may have about these strange things that used to happen. Uh, hopefully they can see things maybe in a little different light. Well, I tell you what, I'm going to be um, taking the picture I used for this show, as well as my picture, and putting it in my video maker, and adding this our conversation to it, and turning it into a video, and putting it in my archives here at my site, as well as up at YouTube, Daddy Motion and Meta Cafe, and I'm going to be sending you those links when I do it, and when I do, since you've agreed that it would be a good idea to come back in August. I'll send you a date in August since I don't have my schedule open right now. And we'll make arrangements to see you again if that works out good for you. Well, that'd be great. Yes, absolutely. All righty. Well, then I'll probably be in touch with you if not tomorrow or the next day because, uh, honestly, I have a show tomorrow, which I don't usually have on Wednesdays, that I'm fixing to tell everybody about after I get off the air with you because I usually try not to hold my guests up while I tell everybody about links I recommend about my show for the next day or... You know, because you're busy and I want to let you go about your business and not hold you up for my personal stuff, in other words. But, uh, I wonder where my wife thinks I am right now. <laughs> <laughs> and my wife, unfortunately, knows where I'm at. <laughs> um, yeah. At any rate, I wanted to go ahead and, uh, you know, ask the listeners to stay put. Uh, uh, I, if I accidentally disconnect the show, folks, I'll try to cover it tomorrow or send out an email. <clears throat> but I'm going to try to 
disconnect the line without disconnecting the show, uh, I want to share some, uh, you know, like I say, my upcoming shows with y'all as well as the, the usual links of the friends I have with y'all. And I'm going to go ahead and with you call it a night if that's okay with you unless you got something else you want to bring up real quick. No, that's fine. And, uh, dude, it's really been a pleasure. It's been an honor to meet you, and I look forward to having you back. Okay. I'm looking forward to it. Okay, doke. You have a good day. Okay. You too. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Okay, everybody. Um, again, tomorrow I'm going to have a show because I rescheduled Saturdays to uh, go to my son's um, karate tournament. And uh, let's see, in fact, at the end of May and June, I'm going to probably have a lot of extra shows I don't usually have. There's some conferences going on, and the only way I could squeeze them all in before a conference date was to actually put them on uh, on off days. There's just, you know, a lot of guests coming up. In fact, guys, I'm already booked into July, starting on August, to give you an idea how busy the show is, which means that I've got plenty of guests for you folks. Um, tomorrow, I'm going to have Willem DeSwart. He's going to talk about the secret numbers of God. And he's found an actual underlying pattern, something dealing with numbers that relates to God that he's going to share with us. Now, the man doesn't have a book out, but he, he does have a website. And he's going to tell you what he has found and why he believes it to be fact. And then, Saturday, we're going to have A New Way to Be Human with Robert Taylor. And um, I'm expecting that to be um, an interesting show. He's um, he's a spiritualist, so he's going to be approaching this from a spiritual angle. And that's going to be my last two shows for April. And as always, I want to remind everybody to... Look on the menu on the left-hand side and um, scroll down to Other. You'll see the Friends link with the um, banners on that page. If you click on it, to adding in a UFO community. Um, and that's one of the Ning sites, adding in a UFO community dot Ning dot com. Or is it dot com dot Ning? I think it's Ning dot com. There's Supernatural UFO and there's United Paranormal International. Or you can just Google these or just click on the links right there on the page. And then right underneath that, uh, under advertising, there's the um, radio links to shows that I recommend. UKPN Radio with Gary. Uh, Jim Herald Radio with, of course, Jim Herald. The Gradian Report with Micah Hanks. And Ohio Politics with Mark Hamill. These are all great shows. They're great hosts. They're people I know personally. I think you'll enjoy them. Also, there's World UFO Today, and in fact, uh, I'm trying to remember, was it June or July that they said it was Nas uh, National UFO Day? I'd have to go look, but you know what? That's coming up in a couple of months, so why not check it out and see what's going on? And I want to thank all you guys for coming because, well, quite naturally, I couldn't have a show without listeners any more than I could without a guest. Uh, it's kind of like having spaghetti without the sauce want to thank you for coming. Please recommend my show to your friends and invite them to come. Uh, tell them a little bit about us. Let them know that membership is free. Let them know that they might need to restart the page when the show starts, that the uh, player's not live until I start the encoder. Uh, let them know chat's free, that they can get a newsletter and stay on top of my shows or whatever. Um, hey, the more people you bring here, the more people you have to chat with and chat. Uh, I'm going to call it quits with that and say good night, everybody. And I want to thank you all for coming and being a part of my show. And until tomorrow at 1, we'll see you then.